Hi everyone, I hope you're enjoying FineConf this year and in, have learned a lot from the earlier presentations. Our next segment is about CloudSync and storing your users' data and documents in the cloud from a standard Fine application. We're going to try and help you to see how your data can be as ubiquitous as the applications with a platform agnostic approach. But I suppose for anybody who might wish to question why the cloud, I thought it would be good to have a couple of thoughts about why this is something important and why now? Well, I mean, we're now in a place where people are working everywhere. Uh, they should, users who are, um, you know, using your applications, building their data, really should and expect to have access to this data whenever, wherever. Your fine application, like any other, is going to run on absolutely any device. But that doesn't mean that the data follows because it's currently stored locally to that device. So if you are working remotely, if you're traveling backwards and forwards already on the train, or if you are spending a lot of time back in the office, can you remember which device you were using for the file that you were working on? Where is your stuff? Is it on your tablet, your laptop? Is it sketched onto your phone whilst you were in the queue waiting for a coffee? Well, as a lot of applications have been starting to realize, it is possible to make the data readily available. And in fact, this kind of storage is really expected on a mobile ecosystem. We've seen tremendous advances through smartphones and tablets and synchronizing in a particularly platform specific approach. And so we want to make it possible for your application data to follow not just as well as the platform specific approach, but on all devices and all platforms. And the trick is, how do we harness that into a fine application with as little hassle as possible? Well, this is the cloud opportunity and we are going to make the most of it. We're going to be persisting the user data to this remote service. In fine terms, that's the preferences and the documents which are stored through the storage API, these items are going to be taken and pushed onto the cloud services. So you don't need to do anything specific about cloud to make this happen. There are different providers available, including Dropbox uh, for piggybacking on top of a platform that people might already be paying for. And Fine Labs and others are also working on their own implementations that will provide uh, fine uh, first-class citizen for storage to the cloud um, from fine applications. And of course, it's important that anybody building an application can sit that on top of their own cloud system. And so it's entirely possible to build your own provider for cloud storage and put that into your fine application in the same way. And hopefully through the next few minutes, we can demonstrate that storage to the cloud using Fine is as easy as it is to build your first Fine user interface. So let's jump into a little bit of code here. How would you integrate a cloud provider, assuming that you found the one that you were looking for, into your application? Well, here we have our application main. It probably looks quite familiar. We're setting up an app, we're creating a new window, and we're running it. The key difference here is we've called set cloud provider. It's the one line of code that has changed this from a local data stored application to a cloud stored data application. We're using the provider from my cloud, which for the record is not one of the cloud providers, but is illustrative here. And so the user preferences and storage is now going to be completely transparently uploaded to the cloud, um, as well as being available on the device. No other code is required for your fine app. It's that easy. Of course, we probably want to look a little bit into how can you make a cloud provider because it's quite possible that the ones that are out there, at least at this stage, aren't the ones that you're looking to integrate into your system. So let's just have a little bit of a look at the interfaces and the workings of how to do that. First of all, we need to implement a new interface called Cloud Provider. 
that is going to allow our code to describe what the provider represents and its capabilities. We have a setup method defined in there, which is where you can perform any login or authentication. In the case of Dropbox, you probably don't need to do anything because it's set up externally. But if you're integrating with a new service that is not known to your device, you're probably going to need to run OAuth or some other handshake that is going to identify you to the remote system. So that's what the setup is there for. Obviously, we want to export that type or provide a constructor so that, in, like in the illustration of the previous diagram, somebody can then pass that into set cloud provider so that their application is ready to run with your implementation. And then we add the actual functionality for delivering cloud elements. There's two main areas at this time. Cloud provider storage is an interface that defines how you can store documents, that is, um, larger items from the storage system. And we have cloud provider preferences, which is used to synchronize user preferences. Now that's just a bit of a quick overview. There will be more details to follow on how some of this is implemented. But for those who prefer a little bit more code and a little bit less description, this is the cloud provider interface. You see the first three methods are just describing this provider and I'll come back later as to why that is quite important. And then we have the setup that I described and cleanup, which is essentially the other end of that. An application could have a cloud provider change in its lifetime. So it's important that we release any resources that were set up during the setup function. The storage provider is simply defined as a single method cloud storage which passes in an app for context and returns a storage type. Now, if anybody's worked with the document and storage APIs in the last release or two, a fine, we'll probably recognize that as a way to get your documents, uh, to list the documents that you have available or to create new ones. And actually, this is exactly what it is. But the result is going to be used and injected into your application. So where local storage was used before, cloud storage is used now. And it's up to the implementation of the provider as to whether it stores locally first and synchronizes later, or if you wish to implement, uh, for some reason, a blocking algorithm which will reach out to a remote system and wait until the data is available. And then essentially the same is provided by the preferences version. We have a cloud preferences function taking an app for context, and it returns a preferences implementation where the data that is being used is not documents, but is essentially a key value store. And now that leads into a little demo. Uh, Derek is going to come on stage and talk to you about how they, he implemented a cloud provider for preferences store to remote system. Hi, I'm Derek Reed, and I'm here to show you how we implemented an offline first synchronized store at Fine Labs. I've been with Fine Labs for about five months, and it's also how long I've been writing Go. So, what do we actually want from a cloud provider? Well, we decided we wanted it to sync data between all the devices efficiently. We wanted it to be great offline, so if you enter some patchy network area, your app still works nicely. We wanted it to fit into the Go ecosystem, so we chose Bolt DB, which is a key value store written purely in Go. We wanted to be conflict free with CRDTs and the last write win algorithm to ensure data convergence across all our devices. So, how do you go about doing something like that? First of all, we created a struct called LAL preferences, and LAL is our code word. It's uh, Star Trek stuff. I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, so in our preferences struct, we have a lock some change listeners and a wait group, which helps us to sync our data. And then we also have our DB. I'll type lal DB, and that's just our wrap of the Bolt DB, of Bolt DB's interface. So the middle line here is to ensure conformity with fine preferences, so to make sure that we've implemented all the methods from the preferences. And we have our constructor here at the bottom, Cloud Preferences, which creates a new instance for us. 
So what are we conforming to? The preferences interface here has many methods with bool, float, int, string, setters and getters. So I'm going to show you how we implemented those in our solution. So here are some, some of our setters. We have bool, float and int and they all take in a key of type string and the bool, the float or the integer. We use the same setter method to write to the database and that takes in a generic interface which we have called value here. So in our set method on the allow preferences struct we check if there's a database because we need the database and then we use bolt db's update function which gives us read and write access. So that gives us a transaction which we call tx here. We grab the preferences bucket, encode the value, and we use boldDB's put method to, to push that to the database. If all goes well, then we call firechange, which is a very exciting function, exciting sounding function. Uh, what this does is essentially it makes all the, the fields and the preferences we get, so it ensures that the change was successful and the app is synced with the database. So if we have a quick look at the getters, so I'll show you the string one here. String with fallback is the, the method which calls or get on the database, but has a helper function there called string. But p.get is what we're looking for here. So let's have a look at get on our allow preferences struct. Once again, it takes in a string, which we'll call key, and our target interface, which we will write our result to. We can use bold databases view function here because that's just read. We don't need read and write access for this, which once again makes a transaction, grabs a preferences bucket, and it gets the key. If successful, it encodes to our target interface, which we can then use for whatever we like. Looking at the remove, very, very similar. We use the update function again for read and write access, grab the bucket, delete, and then at this time we call fire change again to resync the app. That's all very well and good. We now have our device and we have the database and they're happy. But what happens if another device over there, let's say I'm on my laptop and Andrew is on his phone and he updates something, my laptop needs to know what's going on. So we use a listener and a callback so that if Andrew updates the database, my laptop gets a message to then call fire change and my laptop will resync with bold database. Excellent. So that's how we implemented our offline first synchronized store at Fine Labs. Thank you very much and I'll pass back to Andrew. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks so much, Derek. That was really helpful to see how that all comes together. I wanted to wrap up this segment with one other item about how cloud can add to your application. So as well as creating a provider and setting it into your application, whether you built it or you found one that somebody else made, it might be desirable to allow users to choose which cloud provider they want to use. Instead of hard coding the one that you think makes sense for your application, it could be useful to offer users the choice of how they synchronize their data. And so we are working on bringing that in for this current release as well. We're going to store this information globally where possible so that users' uh, choice will be uh, available everywhere and their data from lots of different fine applications then is present in the same remote system and synchronized at the same time. So things like um, working maybe with your Dropbox provider or a complete desktop solution with one cloud provider is able to provide the same sort of seamless experience that platform specific ecosystems have been adding for their applications. For this example, we're going to import a new repository called find.io slash cloud and then call cloud.enable. 
Seriously, it is just that straightforward. Where previously we said app dot set cloud provider, this time we are using the cloud package to cloud enable our application. That's all the lines of code that you would need to cloud enable it. But we do still need an entry point for the user to be able to choose their provider and for potentially configuration to be done with that provider. So there's another line of code that we would certainly recommend adding, which is show settings. In the same package, we're passing the application for context and the window that it should appear in, because this is going to pop up a dialog. So in this example here, we have created a new main menu, the file menu, and added a sync item. And in there, we are saying, show the cloud settings when somebody taps on that button. Again, not hugely complicated. And this is going to bring up the configuration screen using the current theme of the application, which allows the user to pick and configure their cloud provider. The providers available are currently set by the cloud repository, but we're working on ways to increase that and potentially filter it for your convenience. So do be sure to get in touch and tell us how this would work best for you so that we can make sure that this is a good experience uh, as soon as it's available for the release that we're shaping up at the moment. And of course there you can change provider, which is one of the reasons it's really good idea to have your application tidy itself up um, when the cloud provider changes. And so there we have it. We have cloud synchronization for Finapps. The user data is going to be available absolutely anywhere, wherever they are. I think we showed it is really simple to set up and use. And it is using the same preferences and storage APIs that you have used in your application already. Uh, of course, lastly there, we showed how you can allow the user um, to pick a provider or you can set the, own, the one that you think matches your application use case best. And overall, we have synchronized data and happy users. Hopefully, this is going to work just as well for your applications as it has for the ones that we've built so far. But like I said, do feedback in the next couple of weeks as to how you find this gets along, and we will be able to add more to it as the release prepares, or of course, new functionality in that cloud repository as it gets utilized across different applications. Thanks so much for joining us in this segment and we will see you back at the next one shortly.